All right, um, thank you. Let's see if I can get the, this mic at the right level. Um, happy to see so many here. Yeah. And uh, always nice to get out of my office and talk uh, science, even though this feels like a bit of a different audience maybe than what I'm used to. And I, I hope I can deliver what, you, what you're here for. And um, <clears throat> as, um, sorry, I lost your name, Elliot was it, uh, said, I'm a researcher here at Uppsala University. And I did my PhD here uh, many years ago. Uh, then I went to Canada to study wildfires and I came back and now a researcher here and I'm focusing a lot on wetlands and uh, the forests up here at high latitude, more coniferous forests. And I'm trying to understand these systems, uh, how they function and how they will change maybe with climate change and with land use change. And of course here wildfires plays an important role. And that's why I'm here today to talk about wildfires, climate change and land man management. And I'm going to try as much as possible to put this into like a social context. Um, so we'll see how, how I manage. All right. So wildfires. Yeah, so this has attracted a lot of media attention over the last years. Uh, I guess you all have seen the headlines, right, all over the world. Uh, in Sweden, we had last year, with many severe fires, it was all over um, social media, it was on TV, yeah, whatever, all these things. Um, here we have some from this year. Um, we heard a lot about the fires in Amazons, um, but there were other things we see here from uh, Russia, Alaska, uh, Bolivia, all over the world and this, um, <clears throat> these are more like almost horror headlines sometimes. So this is something on the agenda. But in the context of, of climate change now, uh, where it's usually well there are more fires, this is it's more of this, it's more of that, it's more severe, you hear this all the time. Uh, but then it's also good to like, stop a bit. Okay, so are actually wildfires increasing? I think that's a relevant question in this. Uh, and we can look at some of the data we have. This is for, uh, from Canada. They have one of the best data series available. Or the, this is from 1980. Showing, uh, we see the uh, solid line here. That's a number of fires. Uh, which we see is kind of stable, almost decreasing a bit now towards the, the end here. The bars, they show the area burnt, the area in the landscape that actually burned each year. So look at that, we can see that, well, it's kind of hard to, maybe if you squint, you can see that on average, maybe the running mean is increasing a little bit the last five years. Um, but at the same time, we have the highest peaks actually back in the 80s and 90s. So it's, it's kind of hard to, to make a like the conclusion that everything is just getting like more and more fires and bigger and bigger. The red line here, that's the size of Uppland, this county, just so you have a reference point how much that burns in, in Canada. So we can move to Sweden, to this country. Um, we don't have as good data. We have some data here from 98, last 20 years. We see most years we basically have no fires, wildfires in our forest. Uh, we have a few peaks 10 years ago, then we had a famous 2014 fire outside Westeros in uh, Westmanland. And then we of course we had last year, which was a, a pretty bad wildfire year for Sweden. But again, is it increasing? Well, looking at this maybe, but we also know that 50 and 100 years ago, we had a couple of really bad fire years as well. It's just that we tend to, to forget these things. And last, we can look at the global level. So this is burnt area for of the whole earth. And when we look at that, we see actually a decreasing trend over the years. It's still over the last uh, 15 years or something. <clears throat> but this decrease is mainly due to the decrease of burning of grass and shrublands near the equator. 
because at the same times we have seen a bit more intense and severe fires at high latitude. Because 80% of the fires we have, like on, at the global level, are the, that's these uh, shrublands and grasslands that burns. So that can drive this whole pattern. So we also have to look at what's happening at the sort of like local spatial level. What's the unit on this? Uh, uh, this one is normalized, so it's hard to interpret the, the unit uh, here. Yeah. These are all based on uh, from satellite data. Then. So where is it burning? Um, <clears throat> this is an illustration from NASA showing um, a year the pattern of burns wildfires on the global level. So we can see it's like uh, or someone goes back and, and forth, right? This is running. You see how the, the months are changing down here. Um, of course, we see the fires up here at high latitude during the summer and then they disappear in the winter. We see how the fires increases in uh, Africa, for in Australia, for example, during the drought periods. Um, but you can see that we have most of the fires near, um, near the equator, in Africa, for example, and Australia. <coughs> and we can look at um, the burnt area, annual burnt area, and this confirms this picture. Um, Africa is the, the, the fire continent um, together with Australia. We also have a band up, an area in, in Central Asia which, uh, and where we have big annual fires as well, uh, and part of Brazil. And most of these are these, as I said, uh, shrublands and grasslands when they burn. So the more like forest fires that maybe sometimes people think about, they are a quite small proportion of the wildfires we have at the, the global level. So you have these different fires, as I said, we have more the shrub and grasslands and we have the forests. Um, <clears throat> and I think there is a, a bit of a uh, misunderstanding sometimes what a forest fire is and what is actually burning. Uh, at least I have, when I talk to people, sometimes people have the, the idea that um, a forest fire is actually the trees that are burning. Yes, they are burning a little bit. But the tree trunks and everything, that's intact, that's not, it's not consumed. What is consumed is what's on the, the fuel on the bottom of the ground, what grows there, uh, later debris, and up here where we live at high latitude in our coniferous forest, is also the organic soil layer that is consumed. That is what's actually burning, the organic soil. That's where, like, where we lose all the carbon, not the trees. So if you have in the first panel here, I think this is how many people look at, uh, at forest fires, that the forest fire goes by and that is like wasteland afterwards, it's just that everything is gone. But that's not true. I don't know if you have been, some of you maybe have traveled through the areas that burned in Sweden last year. Um, if you do that, you see that, well, the trees are all there, right? It's just that they're, most of them are, are dead. They're still standing for a few more years, then eventually they fall. So the reality is more like this, when you have a forest fire, you're left with, with the, the trees, but they're um, in many cases dead, sometimes they survive as well, and what's burned is the ground. When you have the bush and grassland fires, those areas is just the grass and the, the shrubs, and they get consumed. Those habitats usually don't have much organic soil anyway, so some, you don't lose that much carbon from those systems. So they are very common, but when you do the calculations, they don't actually contribute with so much carbon emission at the global level. It's what we have up here that matters more often. And then, uh, when you discuss these things, okay, are wildfires increasing and what is happening? Uh, people are always looking for kind of a reference point, but it, it used to be that way, it used to be like that. Uh, and then it's 
when you look at a longer time perspective, it immediately gets very hard to sort of like have a reference point. As usually in ecology or when you study these things, you, okay, well, well because things happen, it's dynamic, changes over time, right? Um, <clears throat> so it's a really good study from northern Sweden that look at a quite like concentrated area to look at wild, uh, look at fires in that area. And that study went back 500 years. <clears throat> and the first 200, 250 years there, um, maybe quite low fire frequency. Uh, <clears throat> and then when settlements, so like when people started living in the area more, they started to use the land in a different way. Uh, we started, they started to produce uh, charcoal, a big industry in Sweden. Um, they started to try to uh, a bit of a kind of a, almost like a slash and burn thing to try to um, farm the land sometimes, so they needed the, the fires. Um, which you see an increase there, number of fires. Quite rapid, uh, uh, quite big increase. But then forestry became important in Sweden. And suddenly the that was the value of the forest, and don't, you don't want to burn that down then. So you have a rapid decline in fires in that area. And on top of that, 100 years again, uh, ago, we uh, implemented a, a very good fire suppression here in Sweden. And then basically the fires were gone completely instead. So looking at this, it's of course to say, hard to say, so like, what is a normal fire regime when we humans actually change it so much? Um, <clears throat> and there is another aspect to this that I think it's important to emphasize when you see this uh, kind of doom and gloom headlines, is that ecological systems need fire. Yes, they do. In Sweden, we have probably a hundred species that are more or less fire dependent. So they need recurring fires to sort of like complete their life cycle and to thrive and, and, and grow. So if you have no fires, these species will be gone. And in fact, these species are now threatened in the landscape because we're really good at suppressing fires. <clears throat> many, are, many insects, for example, insects have it quite good though, because they can fly between different fires. Uh, there was a, a lot of fungi. And these fires also reset the system in a way. They produce dead wood that we lack in our forest. And they open up the forest and make it possible for species that, uh, to recolonize. So they're important for the succession of these systems. So fires are not always bad, as you may get that impression just looking at the, reading the news sometimes. And due to this lack of fires, because we have really good fire suppression, we're now actually performing prescribed burning um, here in Sweden. Um, and that is a way to mimic these wildfires that we now are lacking because of our fire suppression. So we took away this element, this disturbance in nature, and now we're trying to sort of like reproduce it <laughs> in a way. Uh, and it's very simple, you basically just um, lit the, the, the forest on, on fire, but under more controlled forms. And you, do, you can choose where to do it, uh, <clears throat> because you may say, well, last year we had so many fires, why do we need to do this now again, right? But this week, this so when we do prescribed burning, we can choose where in landscape we do it, so we can distribute it better, maybe, to help many of these fire-dependent species. It's not only in Sweden we do prescribed burning, though. Um, we have the longleaf pine savanna system in southern USA, uh, used to cover vast areas. Uh, now it's only a fraction left of that. And the US Forest Service is now trying to restore some of that, and they use prescribed burning. You see on this picture, to the left, when you have no burning, very different from the system to the right when you, um, with burning. You get a 
um, <clears throat> a very different ground floor. I get more species, more insects, and everything. Right? This is kind of a, what's called a fire-dependent ecosystem. It's sort of like it's shaped by these recurring fires. Um, um, and there's also sometimes prescribed burning is used to stop very severe wildfires. So maybe you heard about this, but if you suppress fires everywhere, and over time there will build up fuel, right? So if there are no fires, after many years there's, there's a lot of fuel in the forest. So in, the, in uh, Canada and the US, for example, that fuel load can get really big, and then when the fire once comes, it becomes a mega fire, like a firestorm almost, blasting through the area. And you don't want that. So um, <clears throat> what's used uh, then is prescribed burning to have like light fires now and then to remove some of the fuel load so you don't get these mega fires that can be devastating for, for society. So again, this is a way where we control what's going to happen in nature when it comes to, to fire. Okay, <clears throat> so now uh, that was a bit of the background, um, what, what sort of wildfires are, um, how they work a bit, and the situation now. So now we're going to connect it to the climate change. And there are maybe some, some obvious links that I think uh, most of you have heard before. Uh, maybe the most obvious one is with climate warming, we get a warmer climate. And warmer usually means drier, so there is a risk of wildfires. I think we all can kind of agree on that logic. Uh, <clears throat> the other thing though is that with warming, the atmosphere can actually hold more water. So sometimes we get a more humid climate as well. It depends a little bit where you are in the world. So that can actually work in the opposite direction. So the case is not crystal clear. Um, with a more chaotic or like warmer atmosphere, you usually get more lightnings. And with lightning, more lightnings also increases the chance of ignition in nature. So you may have more wildfires due to this. Uh, on the right side, we have some of the feedbacks with wildfires. They're also kind of known or classic. Um, when things burn, when biomass burn, we produce carbon dioxide, a greenhouse gas, and carbon monoxide as well. So there is sort of like, you get, if you get more wildfires, that will burn more fuel. You get more carbon dioxide, more greenhouse gases will enhance the climate change even more. And that is then called a positive feedback, right? Uh, on the other hand, the wildfires also create a lot of smoke. And smoke will block the incoming radiation. So that would have a cooling effect, which would work in the opposite direction, uh, like for uh, of, of global warming. Uh, so that's sort of like, the smoke though will after a while disappear, uh, so this is a very short term effect, while the carbon dioxide will stay around for much longer time. So. So these are often like feedbacks or links that are brought up and, and mentioned and um, are not that hard to, to, to follow. Uh, <clears throat> but of course, it's much more complicated than that. And that's really good for me as a scientist, right? <laughs> and then, and uh, <clears throat> this is of course what, what excites me. Uh, when you get these kind of things that are a bit unexpected or hard to explain and you have to, you know, dig deeper. Uh, so, of course, this is really, really complicated. Um, maybe at the first sight, though, because I'm going to stay here and I'm not to talk a little bit more about this. Because now we're going we're gonna to link this to, the, to, to, to land management here. So, so this is a very central point. Uh, I would say there are two main factors to look at. We have the atmospheric properties and vegetation type in the bottom here. Atmospheric properties uh, 
that's basically the combination, the sort of like the, the gases we have in the atmosphere, the the particles, what it's, what it consists of. Um, <clears throat> the vegetation type is exactly what it says. The vegetation type is kind of what kind of species do we have growing at a in a specific area? Are the trees? What kind of trees? Are the coniferous? Are the broad leaves? Uh, or is it just grass? You know, right? These things will determine a lot when it comes to what is called ecosystem flammability, and that is basically how easy this ecosystem can can burn. Hmm? So depending on what we have on the, the ground and depending on the atmospheric properties and the atmospheric properties will kind of determine the climate and the, if you talk more shorter time span, the weather. Um, so we have these two main factors in the bottom that links up to ecosystem flammability, so how easy the system can burn. And when it burns, we get a fire at the top. And then that fire can have feedbacks, as I talked to before, some of the ones I talked to you before, into this system. After the fire, we may get a vegetation type that is either even more vulnerable, that would be a plus sign, that would be positive feedback, or we get a vegetation type maybe that is less vulnerable to fire, and then you will have less fires in the future instead, and that would be a negative feedback. On the right side, we have the same for atmospheric properties. For example, I mentioned the carbon dioxide, the greenhouse gases, that will be a positive feedback, so plus sign, more fires. Um, so there are all these feedbacks um, going back into this system. Um, <clears throat> so I think this sets the framework, and now we're going to link this up to the land management. Um, we have our greenhouse gases that we produce, which changes the atmospheric properties and the climate. That's a direct link to what we're doing. Next thing is what I also talked about, ignition and suppression. So humans here are kind of gatekeepers for that last link here. We decide a lot what's, when we're going to have ignition uh, or when to suppress. Vegetation type, very much involved in that. That's our land use. We choose what to farm, what kind of farming. Are we going to herd animals in this area? What kind of grassland do we want for that? Uh, forestry, what trees are we planting? Um, <clears throat> so we're, we're, we're deciding this as well to, to a great extent. And then the last thing, um, this is mostly because I'm working with it quite a lot, <laughs> is the draining. Since I'm um, focusing on wetlands in my own research, uh, then draining becomes very important. We drain a lot of land, and we do that because we want to increase production usually. Wetland is not very productive. We want to use that land to produce uh, crops or uh, forest products. So we drain, and when we drain, we get rid of water. That means drier land, uh, increased ecosystem flammability. <clears throat> So as you see, when we start putting these things on top here, we're very much involved in this process and these feedbacks. Um, I'm actually going to skip that one. <laughs> um, <clears throat> and I'm going to dig a little bit deeper into the land management and take a few um, examples to illustrate these, these points. This picture is from uh, Malaysia uh, a month ago. The, well, the picture for, to the left, I should say, where you see um, the haze. So that's basically smoke coming in from uh, wildfires. And to the right, you have a picture of what it looks like a clear day when there are no fires um, in that area. Um, <clears throat> so this is an area that is uh, very exposed to wildfires and fires. And I think you may have heard on this on the news as well. And this is much related to the oil, oil palm problem and these things. And I'm going to dig a little bit deeper to that, but first I also want to show a picture from Moscow. A similar picture in Hayes. 
And this is from 2010. And 2010 was a really wild, bad wildfire year for Russia. Uh, many of their drained wetlands around Moscow burned that year. And they got this smoke coming into Moscow. Created a huge problem. A lot of people died actually. And because of the same thing in, in, in Malaysia. This is really, really bad to inhale, right? So it's, uh, um, <clears throat> it's not good for, for humans at all. And these are then, as I said, uh, this smoke usually comes from drained wetlands. And these wetlands are what's called peatlands. And peatlands are a specific type of wetlands that have very thick organic layer. And if you remember what I said earlier, is that it's not really the forest that burns so much often, it's on the ground. And when you have dead organic mat matter on the ground that is thick and that is dry, that means that that will be consumed, right? And basically then you will get these, these really bad clouds. So, <clears throat> let's look a bit closer to, to Malaysia or the whole Southeast Asia. What we have there is what we call tropical peat swamp forests. So, uh, I mentioned peat before, peatlands. Again, they are basically wetlands where over time the plants have, part of the plants have died and they're on the ground, but there's water on the ground as well, which means that they will not be decomposing. And if you, if you know, here, uh, if you throw um, uh, whatever you throw on the ground outside here, you will not basically not find it in a year, it has been decomposed by soil animals, microbes, etc. But if the soil is waterlogged, if there's water there, there's no oxygen. So much of the, of the biomass will not decompose. So over time you will build up organic matter and that is called peat. So these wetlands, they have maybe 20, 30 meters of peat that has accumulated over 15, 20, 30 years, uh, thousand years. And uh, in the 90s, there was a huge project called the Mega Rice Project in Indonesia, where they decided that they wanted to increase rice product production. So they built canals, I think it was about 4,000 kilometers or something like that, uh, of canals through these peatlands to start farming, for uh, rice farming mainly. Uh, but what happened was that 97 was a really bad El Nino year, so it was really dry. So they had this organic matter, dry organic matter, it got even more dry, and then you got fires. And what happened was that a lot of that organic matter was consumed in these fires. And actually that year, there have been calculations that between 13 to 40 percent uh, of the carbon dioxide that was released through fossil fuel was sort of like consumed in these fires in this area. And since then there has been several years with really bad fires. And it, this year is quite bad again. 2015 uh, was even worse. Uh, <clears throat> and this is all due to the draining of these, these peatlands. And here's a very, it's a current picture, just, uh, uh, I think this one is a few weeks old. It has started raining in this area, so these fires are starting to, to sort of like um, dimin diminish. Um, but I don't, I don't know how well you can see here, but you may see that it's kind of a pattern behind here with lines and things, which are basically, uh, most of them are, are ditches. And you can see that these fires sometimes follow these lines, Nicely, uh, and that means that uh, people are trying to burn off these plots. <coughs> mm. um, all the red, uh, the red, more yellowish is burning right now. You see the cloud, uh, the smoke coming up. Um, you see some areas here where it's more um, 
burnt like scars, fire scars that has been burnt already. So you see, the whole landscape basically has more or less affected. But you also see some areas where it's not the fire is more irregular, right? That means that it has been kind of gone wild, that people don't be able to control it all the time. So you, we have this very uh, big and severe fires in these, these peatlands. And these are then um, intentionally started, of course, because we have these drain areas. You chop down the forest usually, um, you can sell that off, and then you're left with debris and stuff. And you want to get a fresh start for farming, so then you put it on, you know, put it on fire to get rid of that. Um, but you can't really control that, uh, and maybe you, it's hard to put out. When these peatlands burn, that organic matter is really hard to stop that from burning. You basically have to go in and, and hose it down. So it burns for a very long time. Um, <clears throat> And I'm going to try to, to explain how this works, because I'm now showing for uh, Southeast Asia. But this is actually the same, this is the same process for the fires we had around Moscow, which were also peatlands that burned. And it's actually the same problem we have in Sweden when we have some of the fires, because we have drained our peatlands as well, mostly for forestry, also for our agricultural land. On the agricultural land we don't get much fires, obviously, but, but in the forest we do. So the same, what we see here, applies to many other areas. It's not only in Southeast Asia. So we have these this wetlands with carbon stored there, which is good. It works like a carbon storage, and these, if they are left alone, they will still accumulate carbon uh, and remove carbon from the atmosphere. And that is something we are urgent to need, right? Uh, <clears throat> when we look water the water level, we add oxygen to the system. Uh, with oxygen, microbes are thriving better, so they start to decompose. So we start to release carbon immediately when we do this, which is a problem. But uh, if we um, uh, then have a fire on these systems, then we have now basically dry fuel, dry peat. I mean, we still use a bit of peat in the, uh, here in, in Uppsala to, to produce hot water, actually. Um, <clears throat> so this is, this is good fuel. It's really high energy and everything, right? And here it's dry now. Um, so we got this, uh, these peat fires, produces quite toxic smoke, not good if you live in the area. And that will sort of like chop off, consume the top layer, produce uh, and release all that carbon. And if we go back to, and then to um, Malaysia for example, in that area, what happens there is that usually you plant maybe uh, oil palm on that land or some other crop, um, it depends. If you're a, a small local farmer it might be something else. Um, <clears throat> from, you can also have a situation, for example, that mega rice project uh, as any large scale a project like that, it was doomed to fail. Um, so many of those areas were abandoned eventually, and now it's kind of recolonized by other trees. Uh, and what the, what colonizes that area, for example, are some some species of acacia trees, which are very fire prone. So there is a risk that you get fires again because of the vegetation that colonizes these kind of dry peat areas now. So there are one of these feedbacks, again, depending on what vegetation you get. Um, here's a picture of me. <laughs> you should always have a picture of yourself, they tell you. Uh, <laughs> um, and this is from, uh, from Sweden, so we're back here now. Uh, and this is from the fire we had in, in Westmanland outside Westeros. 
And this is one of the drained peatlands we have in Sweden. Uh, in this case, it was drained for uh, to increase forest uh, production. Uh, and you can see the trees behind me where I'm standing. Um, and this illustrates again that it's not the trees that burn, it's the ground that burn. The trees are almost intact, right? Uh, <clears throat> but I'm now standing on here on what is mineral soil, which means there is no organic matter left. That was like consumed in this fire. <clears throat> so, um, it doesn't matter if you're in Asia or in Moscow or in Sweden. When you drain these peatlands, there is always a risk uh, in terms of what happens when you get a fire. So, <clears throat> you may then ask, um, what is the solution? I mean, can we do something about this? Oh, this is not really good, right? That, that we have this problem. Um, and of course, the, the solution is kind of simple in a way. We just have to re-wet these areas or restore them somehow. To the left here is a picture from uh, a dam. Um, down, I can't remember now if, where it is exactly, but um, <clears throat> in a, it's a tropical swamp forest at least, uh, where they try to restore it, the area, and re-wet. To the right, we have a dam outside, uh, in the area outside Moscow, Russia. Um, and because after the fires in Moscow 2010, I mean, the, it was, they realized that they, this is a problem. We don't want this to happen again. So uh, they actually initiated a huge, uh, a big re-wetting program where they re-wetted tens of thousands of hectares of drained peatlands around Moscow to prevent this to happen. And that has been really successful. So they went out, built these dams like you see to the right. Um, <clears throat> Southeast Asia, much more complicated. A lot of people are living in these areas, depend on that land, right? Uh, it's not just to go in there and say, well, you need to, you know, revet this area. You can't do that. It's like social, socially impossible, yeah. economically impossible, politically impossible, basically. Very complex problem. And um, a problem that many of you in here are probably more familiar with how to, to deal with. Uh, <clears throat> so, um, I think it's clear that land management is a very dominating factor when we talk about the fire regimes we have on Earth right now. Um, what we do with our land, the land use, will determine a lot when it comes to the, sort of like, um, the implications, the, sort of like the, the results when we have fires and how often we have fires, etc. There are a few exceptions. Um, we do see more fires in the Arctic, it seems like, even though it's, kind of, it's not easy to get a good idea how much fires it has been there historically. But, um, and these fires are, of course, not really related to land management or land use. We're not doing much up in the Arctic yet, maybe I should add. Um, <clears throat> and these fires are usually not started by, by humans in a way. Uh, and I think the same goes for some, some systems still up here in the boreal, like uh, northern parts of Russia, some parts of Sweden, Canada, Alaska, and this. there are some other parts of the world also where it's uh, <clears throat> maybe not so human influenced still. Though. But those are more exceptions than the rule. Um, so, just to um, wrap this up a bit, um, if we talk about the future land management then, because I think, I hope it was clear from, from this presentation that we shape the current fire regime. And when you have the combination of, of bad management plus climate change, you can get a, a problem here. You get very high fire risks. And uh, so to deal with this in the future, you need some more 
um, adaptive management. You need to understand sort of like what you do with a land will change how it can react to climate change in terms of fire. Uh, what you put there um, is you have to think like, are these things, what kind of climate will we have? Will these things we have here, the system, what we're trying to do with this land, will it be fire prone? Will it be very vulnerable to fire? Or will it be more resistant, for example? Uh, <clears throat> but these are very complex social ecological systems. Uh, and I would say there are quite few silver bullets. It's not just to say, well, we're always going to do this or that. Um, there are more or less uh, like country dependent or context dependent in many ways. Um, and I mean, there are, um, yeah. So I think that's one of some of the take home messages, messages I, I want to say. All right, thank you for listening. I'm happy to take questions. Yeah, so let's start with the, the first one then. Uh, so the term wildfire is kind of ambiguous actually. I think you have a good point there that it's not a really clear cut. Um, it usually, as the term suggests, wild, something you is out of control that you don't really, yeah, you, you're not, that's, you can't really control that. It's, it's on its own now. And um, it's, Usually, I think it's used in a way that it doesn't matter who started it or how it started. It's more like what's, how it's uh, the behavior of the fire, I would say. Uh, so that it's called prescribed burning, for example, of a reason. Uh, it used to be called controlled burning until people realized there is no such thing as controlled burning when you're out doing these things because things can always go wrong. And it happens, right? So they try to avoid the word control burning because it gave the false impression that we are in control when we do these burns. So, so the second question, uh, you talked about losses. Do you mean the carbon or that? Carbon and ecological losses? Yeah. The Amazon, for yeah, so, yes. Yeah, so the things that are going on, that so sort of like is going on in the Amazon, where people intentionally put things on, on fire um, to, to clear land for for growing crop or herd animals, or whatever it is, is of course a very different type of of uh, prescribed burning than what we do here, because our intention here is to have um, not severe fires but intermediate fires to sort of like facilitate for fire dependent species. And the same thing when they do in the, the what I talked about in the US, for example, right? And, and this is a much smaller scale as well. Uh, in terms of carbon, um, I haven't seen any numbers by, as by guessing in the Amazons, those uh, fires, as I said, are usually just trying to burn off debris, a bit of grass and shrub. I don't think there are a huge amount of carbon losses, actually. Um, that said, I haven't seen any data on it, so, but uh, just based on what, I, what they probably burn, I, I would be my guess. My, my guess would be that really long dry periods will make things worse. So it doesn't really matter if you have a, a really wet period in between. I think longer dry periods is, is worse than like intermediate uh, over a longer time. That would be my, my, my guess. Um, these things depend a little bit on, on the landscape of what the type and the topography, how much water can actually be stored um, in, in the system. Um, the other question is, is there something good with uh, this kind of mega fire, um, well, uh, it depends on what you, how you define good in this case, I guess. But uh, rarely, I would say there is, It is correct though that with smoke and larger fires, you can actually build up uh, basically rain clouds. So uh, they have seen now that bigger fires definitely have direct implication for the weather, quite far away. Um, can imp implicate for the, the fires, um, weather system and form clouds and all that. Um, but these things in general are quite 
quite short term, I would say, uh, in that case. Is but, there a definition for a good fire? Uh, I think the, the prescribed burning we do here and sometimes parts of the states and whatever, you know, to, um, those are maybe good fires. Um, some of the wildfires that are out of control in areas where we don't have many people living. Um, I mean, they are needed for the ecological system to be maintained, in a, to, to maintain some diversity and things, right? So those are good from a ecological point of view, maybe. I think it, that depends on who you ask, I guess. Um, uh, another risk with these uh, big mega fires is, of course, when you talk about California and that area. Uh, so we have in this, some of these parts there, we had some uh, threatened forests. We had uh, like big redwood trees and all these things, right? So they're afraid that it will be a buildup of fuel in those areas. So they're trying with prescribed burning there to keep like, the fuel load like quite uh, low to avoid mega fires because they may actually be able to kill off these these giant trees in, in, because there are certain areas, right? So there is very the Forest Service do have very active management. Uh, here to try to understand how to deal with this, yeah. Um, short answer, I have no idea. <laughs> um, there, um, I think there are, I mean, systems, I mean, uh, um, I mean, the central parts of some of the tropical forests we have, I think you rarely have any fire there. They're just very humid and wet, right? So that's why sometimes you see the Amazon is on fire and people think, you know, oh, the tropical forest is burning, but it's not really happening, right? It's very, very rare that that happens. If it ever happens, I don't know, actually. Um, I don't know if anyone really have observed it in a way or... Um, but I mean, as I said, now at least we see fires up in the Arctic, and they may have had some fires at least now and then. Um, so fire, I think, is, is yeah, it's very rare that you have no fire whatsoever. And historically, I mean, one thing that I haven't talked about, but something that determines a bit of the fire regime when it comes to that atmospheric property is, of course, also the amount of oxygen. We're now at roughly 20% of oxygen, uh, so things have to be quite dry to ignite and burn. And we should be happy that we don't have like 30% of oxygen because then things combust, com, com, <laughs> combust like that, right? Uh, <clears throat> I think it's like even humidity as like water content of 80% or something can then burn. Um, but yeah, so over time, I mean, fire regimes have varied a lot depending on this like geological time scale uh, changes. Yeah. Um, this larger fires, both I mean, both in, in Russia and, and and in Canada, for example, Alaska. I mean, these these things are happening in remote areas that it will just you know it was almost be impossible to try to to do something. So you know, it's not worth it. And but okay, so when do they stop? Um, sometimes they can burn quite a lot, of course, but uh, eventually the weather will change and humidity will increase. And I think that's one of the main regulating factors here is that wind is one thing. So uh, if you have strong winds, fire can travel rapidly, cover huge areas quickly. Um, that's actually what happened here in Sweden when we had a bad fire, bad fire in Westmanland. Uh, what happened was that the wind picked up and over 24 hours it just you know, went so far. Uh, so the wind is important. So if the wind, if there is windy and the wind sort of like stops, um, then the fire will stop as well. Another thing is that if humidity goes up a bit, so the fuel a bit more moist, then eventually it will die out uh, as well. So there, there is unusual that, uh, that you have like, unless you have a lake, of course, that will that is big enough so you can't, so you can't have like uh, spread over the lake. Um, but, um, but otherwise there are very rarely that there are like landmarks or anything that will cut off the fire. It's mostly when, when the weather change 
that's um, that's when you when it's die when it dies out. Yeah. So in Sweden, it's actually the uh, most of the prescribed burns in the forest is actually on private land. Yeah, because that is uh, done by um, the big forest companies. Since they are certified, they have to burn at least 5% of the area that they cut every year. So they, they actually do the bulk of the work when it comes to prescribed burning in Sweden. Uh, the state, sort of like the county boards, they do some. And that is mostly due to uh, a project um, uh, funded by the European Union uh, that's going on right now. But otherwise, it's the, most of the forest companies actually that do this uh, prescribed burning um, in, in this case. And that is due to the certification, so they are obliged to do this. It's uh, basically because we are really good at suppress the fires. Uh, we don't really like, uh, I mean, uh, we don't like fires because uh, sometimes they will, um, they will destroy so like um, for oh, economical value, right? So in Sweden, we don't want forest fires because the forest is valuable. We need a, it for timber or pulp or whatever. So the forest owners are very concerned that the forest should not burn and that's why when the forest started to become important in Sweden, the forest fires basically stopped and now we're suppressing it, right? So that's why we have a lack of natural fires. Um, and that in some areas we don't want it either because people are living there. Uh, so even though if the forest is not maybe that valuable, uh, we still don't want these things because we have people living in the area, basically. So that, I think that's the, the main reasons. Okay, but you also said like that sometimes it's really necessary that forests are not burning, so maybe just some people don't really know about that, even if they deal with forests. Yeah, so because of this we don't have, as I said, because of these things now we don't have enough natural fires for these species that depend on that, right? Or this, the natural, like the, this is a natural disturbance as well. In, in these systems, and now, now suddenly that is gone. So now, now we're trying to re, recreate that in a way in some areas. Yeah. And of course, that is a bit of a pedagogical problem sometimes, because like last year we had these huge fires in Sweden, and then people wonder like, what are you doing? Why are you doing more fires? Like, isn't that enough? <laughs> <laughs> so it, it is a bit of a challenge to, to explain that, right? Of course. This question is, of course, um, very hot right now <clears throat> and has been debated back and forth. Um, um, in, in some areas, that is definitely true. If we replace something with something that is very fire prone, as I talked about, if we replace with a tree that we know burns easily, then yes. Uh, you, if you replace, if you have quite fire resistant trees and then maybe you plant just um, eucalyptus in a dense form or something that will have uh, some implications, right? So, yes, I, I think it does. Then, of course, it's not always that easy because sometimes some trees are, are also quite, um, um, quite fire resistant in a way that you didn't expect. So, in Sweden, there has been a lot of debate around the spruce forest that uh, last year was not saying that, well, it's because we have planted all these dense spruce monocultures, for example. But what we see here in Sweden is that what actually do not burn so well are these dense spruce monocultures. Because they are so dense, so there is nothing on the ground. There is, not, there is nothing. If you go into a plantation of, of spruce, you don't find anything on the ground. It's just dark and, and brown, basically, you find some mosses. Um, so they can almost work as a, like uh, like layers or uh, what do you say like um, where it, the fire will stop in a way. 
So sometimes it's not that uh, easy. It's also been debated a lot how much, well, if, only, if we have more broad leaves in the forest, that will stop forest fires. And of course, um, birch, for example, in Sweden will burn less than pine, probably. Um, but that is assuming that you plant quite large areas with only birch. Um, and then the question is, if you just have a little bit of birch, probably doesn't matter that much. You probably have to go all out uh, to have a, an effect on that. In, in general, I don't think sort of like the tropics are really important for the to providing us with oxygen or something like that. That's why this kind of the lungs of the earth and, and things like that is, uh, is not really correct, as my understanding of the world. Uh, we get a lot of oxygen from what's happening in the oceans, actually. That's usually the, have a much greater implication. Uh, if it's a surplus or net or negative, that I, I don't really know, but that is, uh, but I think in general you're, you're correct. Uh, <laughs> Um, rarely things stay stable in nature, I would say. So it's, it's probably going to be more of a dynamic system um, than that. But over, I mean, over longer time scales, you have, um, you have changes, right? That, as I say, if you have things, you can see this in, I think there are signs of this in northern uh, parts of, of Canada and, and Alaska, where they have had some areas that has been uh, affected by the wildfire and um, then there have actually been wildfires again quite recently afterwards so which means that there's more and more deciduous trees that will just uh, establish and, and survive uh, so sort of like re-establish over and over so many of the coniferous trees will not come in and establish uh, there are some trees in, in uh, the lodge pine um, uh, lodgepole pine, for example, uh, usually needs uh, <clears throat> uh, it needs 40 years before it start producing seeds. So if you have a new fire within 40 years, that that one will not reproduce, for example, right? So then you will have more uh, deciduous trees, maybe some other species coming in, and you will have another another system in that sense um, that will balance things out um, and over time that will probably prevent fires from coming back to too soon again and then, um, things will move from that so there are uh, both long like short-term feedbacks that may affect but also long-term feedbacks at the more ecosystem level that will, will play a role and even at the longer time scale of course then there are evolutionary feedbacks as well things adapt to these changes but uh, we're not probably experiencing that uh, once I was sitting in here. Mm -hmm.